Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our technical assistance call. We want to thank you for joining. Uh, we, this is a follow-up technical assistance call to last month's webinar on working with continuums of care for anti-trafficking organizations. We will be recording this webinar in this session, so that way you can have access to the questions and the answers um, at a later time, and you can also share with your colleagues. Uh, also, as a note, there is closed captioning available. If you click the CC button at the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to get that um, transcript. And also, we're going to be sharing a link in order to uh, open closed captioning in a separate browser if you would prefer that. You'll see that link on the chat box. And this is being hosted by the Freedom Network Training Institute, um, who handles and manages the FNTI Housing Training and Technical Assistance Project. Uh, this project is meant to address housing for survivors of trafficking. And as such, we will bring different topics that surround and are um, geared towards housing um, in different areas, one of them being continuums of care and systems within the housing world. We provide web-based trainings, resource, uh, we have a resource library that you'll be able to access. We'll drop the link on the chat box as well. And then we have technical assistance. So and that being part of this uh, call, but also we have more in-depth opportunities to get that technical assistance. Okay. Our speakers today are Jasmine Kahn. She is from the Alaska um, Continuum of Care. She is the executive director and has a lot of experience in leading that organization. We also have Jill Bolander Cohen. She is uh, from Lifeboat Project and is an anti trafficking service provider. And finally, we have Martha R., who is from the Central Florida Lead C uh, and she's the lead COC in Central Florida uh, with the Homeless Services Network. We're very thankful that they're joining us today and they'll be able to answer questions for us in, um, throughout the presentation. And so we have had a number of questions that were submitted through the registration form. We do encourage you to type in questions into the chat box, and we will have some time towards the end for the panelists to address those questions. So some of the, your questions may already be addressed throughout the presentation, um, but if anything comes up or if you want a clarification, please feel free to use the chat box and we'll make sure to address it there. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, the first question is for Jasmine, and it is, what are the requirements to be involved in a continuum of care? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for asking this question. I, I think it's a, a bit complex because it's really a tiered approach. What, what is the level of involvement that you're interested in having with a continuum of care or a COC? So I think, but it's most formal. There's always agencies that are interested in inquiring about how to access COC funding, which of course your local lead agency is a conduit uh, to bring funding from HUD on a federal level into a community. And so that is often defined by the COC itself. Um, there's certainly some HUD requirements as to um, who is eligible to receive COC funding locally in each community, but each COC um, and the partnership that's involved in the actual continuum of care will define local priorities, and those local priorities are incentivized in the local application process. So I think if folks are interested in that most formal level of engagement by actually um, looking at the opportunity to access some of those COC funds, um, your best bet is to contact your local COC and try to understand what they incentivize, what are the community priorities, and whether your organization matches up to that. I think more broadly, uh, we really encourage multi-sector stakeholders to get involved in their local continuum of care. We have everyone from the Department of Justice to our local anti-trafficking entities, um, to community members, churches, and the more stakeholders we can have at the table to discuss issues around housing and um, homelessness, the better for our clients, the better for our community. So generally speaking, in, in terms of becoming part of a COC as a member, um, as a contributing party, as a stakeholder, even just as a general community member, most COCs are very welcoming. Um, I have yet to come across one that would say, you know, we don't encourage your engagement or your involvement. 
Um, and then there's the middle ground, right? So there's the sort of loose knit community coalition building where I really do believe all are welcome. There's the more formal levels of funding access. And then I think in the middle ground are our core partners who we share clients with, um, who oftentimes are the anti-trafficking entities in the community. Um, and then there's different committees that folks can get involved in, even if they're not a direct recipient of grants. Um, to provide input, to advocate for their clients. So there's many different tiers to it. Um, and again, I think the level of formality will be dependent on the local lead agency. Perfect, thank you so much, Jasmine. The next question that we have is, what happens during a COC or a continuum of care meeting? So Jill, we'll start with you. Um, obviously as an anti-trafficking organization, we'd love to hear your experience with what that meet, those meetings look like. And then Martha will also pass it on to you afterwards to know a little bit more about what's happen, what happens during those meetings, how often they're held and who participates. So Jill, we'll start with you. Great, thank you all for being here and asking these follow-up questions. Um, so what happens during a COC meeting? Well, everyone signs in and, um, well, at our COC meeting, which Martha runs fantastic, uh, everyone can sign up to be on different committees. All, all of that is spelled out when, when you walk in and there's packets. Um, we go over um, whatever the topic is, if we're talking about a housing first model or whatever the particular, particular top topic is if we're getting ready for the NOFA, uh, pertinent information that the agencies need to know. And then uh, we, we do community building. We sometimes, if we're sitting at round tables with other agencies, we do, uh, we have a few questions that will, will be uh, posed to the group and we, you know, um, we comment on, you know, what is your agency doing? How can we better collaborate together? It's it's just a it's a great time to fellowship and find out what everyone else is doing and stay up with what uh, a lot of what HUD has got got going on. So Martha can elaborate more. That the the COC meetings um, are different. In, in each COC, so uh, what happens in one community may not be the way another community uh, conducts business. They, uh, you have general membership meetings, and I think most communities have those roughly once a month, but some only do them once a quarter. Um, and then there are frequently several committee meetings that will focus on planning or focus on uh, on how to participate in the uh, database systems and the HMIS or their comparable systems. There can be focusing on um, how to be engaged in the coordinated entry system process. Um, and so all the different activities of the COC, there'll be opportunities to go, uh, some of the meetings focus on those. But many times your general membership monthly meeting is, as Jill said, it's an opportunity to get to know the other partners. Sometimes training is conducted during those meetings and sometimes training is conducted separately. Um, so training range on anything from what does it mean to be a housing first program to how to how to use motivational interviews, interviewing skills to cultural competency and, you know, all kinds of training opportunities. Um, and uh so the, I think the big thing is that the meetings are different in each community. They are part business. They are partially done to used to uh, to be able to conduct specific business requirements that HUD requires at the continuum of care. But the majority of the time, the meetings are about how do we improve our community system of care? How do we improve our collaboration and our partnerships? And how do we support each other and providing the best the best services for people experiencing homelessness across our region. Great, thank you so much. The next question that we have is gonna be for uh, Jasmine. Uh, what is the point in time count or the pit count? Um, if you could tell us a little bit about what it is, what it measures and who participates. And also we'd like to hear from Jill afterwards about why it's important that survivors of human trafficking be represented in this count. Of course, so the point in time count is actually um, a federally defined activity. I think the term is often used 
loosely in, in local context. But um, essentially, there is one night in January, and there's some flexibility about the exact date, but there's one night in January that um, every community in the country counts the number of people experiencing homelessness on that night. Um, I certainly had a lot of raised eyebrows about this in Alaska because we do this one night in January. And as a California girl by birth, I was very confused as to how there were people experiencing homelessness at night in Anchorage. Um, it unfortunately is a reality of our work across the country. Um, different communities have some flexibility in how they structure it, but essentially um, we use our homeless management information system that we talked about in our last call to track um, ridership on the bus, if you will. The easiest analogy is to think about your local metropolitan um, communication system and think about your bus. Um, so HMIS can tell us how many people have touched our services throughout the year. The point in time count is designed to complement that by telling us how many people experienced homelessness on that given night. Um, the simplest way of thinking of this are there are two pieces to this count. One piece of this is understanding who are using our formal services, and we call that the sheltered count. So who is utilizing our shelters, who's utilizing our rapid rehousing programs, any other type of housing that we have available through the city's system um, or that continuum of care system. However, it's really critical to complement that, that we count the number of unsheltered people. So those are people, as defined by HUD, who are staying in places that are not considered appropriate for human habitation. So think a car, a sidewalk, um, in Anchorage, in particular, we have a number of encampments that spring up in the winter months, and so people living in tents. And the idea is to canvas the community and, and literally count people who are experiencing homelessness outside. Uh, I think it's really critical that we, we continue to do these unsheltered counts. Some communities, just due to resource restrictions, um, actually do this part of the count every other year instead of every year. Uh, but it, as you can imagine, requires a tremendous amount of community mobilizing. Um, we really rely on volunteers to assist with the unsheltered count. Um, and it can be a very powerful experience for community members who are going to interact with um, people experiencing homelessness for the first time. Um, it's not the only way we collect data, but it tends to get a lot of visibility um, because it gives us nationwide comparisons. It allows us to look at nationwide trends if the methodology is consistent. And I think um, what's really important to also note as subtext is it is one of the factors that HUD considers when HUD is looking at how much money to allot to different continuums of care, both in the sense of trends, are you using the money wisely and addressing your local problem, but also in terms of understanding needs. Uh, so I'll let Jill talk a little bit about survivors and the point in time count. Thank you. This is a great opportunity. Um, actually, for the Lifeboat Project, this was our first pit count that we did, and we did it in our perspective area um, outside of Orlando, but still within our Orange County district. Um, it's like the second largest city within um, Orange County. Um, but it gave us a chance to get out amongst um, amongst our homeless population and be able to have a conversation about services that we could potentially um, provide for them or someone that they know that might be vulnerable or might be being trafficked. Um, it, it, um, many of our trainings over the years that we may have gone to for talking about human trafficking, a lot of times we don't talk about, you know, the homeless and the housing component of it. So, so this was kind of an eye-opening experience for us and a way for us to, um, get out and, and, and mix amongst our um, homeless in the area and ways that we can potentially help. It also gives us a great connection with other agencies that are strictly working with um, homeless individuals. And um, if they see a potential case that they might need services and help with, um, you know, we're there to, to move in and assist them. Great, thank you so much. The next question that we have is, what information do anti-trafficking organizations need to, sh to share with the COC? So Martha, if you could start us off with what sort of information is shared um, with that lead continuum of care or that continuum of care lead. And then Jill, if you could talk about the information um, that you would share as an anti-trafficking provider and how they might, that might be a little different. 
Absolutely. Um, I think the most important thing for you to know is that you do not have to share any client level data with your COC. There's no expectation that you would um, be sharing client level data. So do not get panicked about that, worry about that, stress about that. You should never be asked that type of, of information. What is helpful and what you will be asked will be information about how your how your program works, how do people access the program, what's the best way to make referrals, um, and um, how so that folks are able to better ensure that eligible people are able to get to your services, as well as how can you help your clients who are eligible for other COC services to access those resources. And then secondly, what kind of aggregate data do you have? HUD loves data. Oh my gosh, they love data and they ask for a lot of data in their applications and in other processes. So there's a significant amount of, of the your lead agency staff time is going to be spent on, on procuring aggregate data and and translating that in the ways to to get to HUD and to get out to the community at large. So uh, the more information that you have available, uh, uh, aggregate information about your program, about how many people access your program, how many people are you not able to serve due to capacity, what kind of services you provide, what's been effective, what's not, what kind of outcomes do your programs have, um, that type of information, uh, demographics, anything like that that can help the community better understand your services. The COC wants that information from you, but again, that would be aggregate information. Thank you. Great. Uh, Jill, are you, are you able to talk a little bit more about the um, information that you provide as the anti-trafficking provider? Okay. So I think uh, one of the most important things is that um, we really let, let the rest of the COC know what the services are that we um, provide for the uh, survivors and that it is intensive case management. And sometimes in talking with other organizations, um, I, you know, express the importance of maybe when they're interviewing someone that they may not at first suspect that they're um, a, a victim. It's just all in different interviewing techniques and even down to, you know, how are you p positioning yourself to interview them, the space that they're in. Um, some of the other things are uh, what and where are the gaps, um, so we can we can address these. We we had a situation this past week um, that uh, there were were a few glitches in the process of one uh, of of streamlining the continuum of care with with a uh, with a victim, and um, it it wasn't to the lifeboat satisfaction. So we're addressing it meeting immediately. We're calling a meeting with other. Um, members and saying, okay, um, we, this needs to go better. We need to do better than this. So, um, so it's it's just a, it's a great opportunity for everybody to come together and make sure that we provide the best care for um, for survivor or victims. Thank you. And before we move on to the next question, um, if just a reminder, if you're on the if you're a participant, feel free to type in any questions that you may have. Um, around continuums of care in the chat box, and we'll have some time to answer them towards the end. So our next question is, does HUD require an assessment form or tool that our COC can use? Uh, this question is gonna be for Martha. Sorry, gotta take myself off the mute. Apologize for that. Um, it's a good question. HUD does require that the community have some type of an assessment form or of an agreed upon assessment tool to use to uh, prioritize services and resources. And that tool is um, expected to uh, somehow help quantify individuals need for services and vulnerability um, when if, the, if services are not provided. The vast majority or the most popular tool across the country is uh, called the, the VI SPDAT. Um, and that one's used uh, by a large percentage of the market. Um, it was created up in Canada by a, a gentleman named Ian DeYoung. 
Um, but communities are en encouraged, to, they can use that one, but they can also uh, use one that they create themselves as long as it is somehow objectively identifying people's health needs and other service needs, what their, um, what kind of challenges they face on the streets um, as a way to quantify uh, their, the depth and breadth of the issues that they're facing uh, and as a way to help give the community some, some mechanism to prioritize limited resources. Great, thank you. The next question is gonna be for Jasmine. Um, the question is, are victim service providers included in any of the data on system performance measures? So I think we're hearing again and again that yes, HUD really enjoys data. And I think all of us would like to be in a place to have better data informed uh, momentum for our communities. There is a high degree of sensitivity around victim service providers. So I think as, as most folks on the phone are likely to know, um, the definition of victim service providers comes from the Violence Against Women Act, the VAWA Act. Um, and so currently, victim service provider projects do not enter client level data into HMIS. Um, most COCs have expectations that um, providers that do need to protect the confidentiality and the privacy of their clients at that degree have a comparable database and when necessary will share certain aggregate data or data outcomes with us as a COC in order for us to be able to proceed. So I think point in time count is a great example. We call our victim service providers and just ask for the number of clients that they served on that night versus asking like we do with other providers for an actual uh, set of identifying information so that we can deduplicate. Um, obviously, privacy is critical for clients in this space. I think the other thing to think about when, when in terms of this question directly for system performance measures is that system performance measures are extracted directly from the HMIS system. So we have to recognize that that data does not cover um, this particular area of the work because of that reason, uh, which is an obvious weakness and something that unfortunately we don't have the resources and um, the momentum to cover at this point in time. Thank you. The next question, uh, we're gonna start with Jill. Um, we would like to hear about how can you get housing for a survivor? who may have a criminal background. And so we'd love to hear definitely from Jill, but also after that, Martha and Jasmine, if you've run into this, we'd love to hear your answer as well. Okay, um, the COCs have their housing locators. Martha can talk a little bit more about that, um, that work with the local um, landlords. Um, you know, and of course, a lot of times we are working on expungement of records. Um, Lifeboat has a, a few places that if they have a criminal background, you know, and we've assessed them, we can potentially take them in too. But um, Martha can speak um, probably a lot more on that. Thanks, Jill. Um, our COC, our lead agency uh, here in our COC does have what we call a housing locator or housing operations team. And that is a, a team of folks that are ch are charged with their job is to go out and identify landlords that are willing to work with program participants of, of our COC and then maintain connection with those landlords while while they have COC tenants um, living with them. And that team is is thoroughly integrated into the coordinated entry system process so that as people are selected to participate to receive housing subsidy and case management, then that team um, receives information about, about what the housing needs are for that particular individual or family so that they can try and find a unit that best matches. Um, and, and so we've been, you know, we're fortunate to have that team and increasingly more, more continuums of care are adding that type of landlord relation staff to their coordinated entry system teams, but you don't see that everywhere, but many of them do. If that's not something that's available within your community, if you don't have folks who are out there actively looking for these units on your behalf, then, then some of the things that are helpful are to, is, are to present to realtors associations, to local apartment associations, and to other groups of professionals who are involved in this, 
when you're talking to them, you're usually looking for Class C apartments. Those are going to be kind of the cheapest apartments in your community that still meet code. Um, they many times they used to be cream of the crop, but 30 years later they're not they're not where people want to live, and so they um, they're older apartments. They usually don't have as many bathrooms and things like that, but um, but they do have to still meet code. Sometimes you're looking at rental houses. Sometimes um, landlords are more willing to have somebody with a with a criminal record in one of their rental houses rather than uh, in a more densely populated apartment complex. One of the things we know is that if you get in with a landlord and you and they have a good experience with some of their initial tenants that you've referred to them, then they're more likely to be take, uh, willing to take some additional risks with you. And so we usually don't send somebody with a criminal history as our first referral to a landlord, but instead we get we kind of get our foot in the door and try and make sure that's a positive experience uh, so that they gain some trust of us and our system, that they know that the case managers are going to be responsive and that they have a mechanism for asking for help if there's troubles with the tenants. And then we ask them to push on some of their uh, eligibility criteria. One of the things that is pretty standard is that you are going to have much less success with large property managers um, because if many of them work with, have work with owners, property owners, developers, kind of at a national level, and they set their criteria at a national level, and they don't have any flexibility at the local level. So what you're wanting to really look for is the smaller mom and pop landlords who get to make their own decisions locally about specific clients and then have the conversations with them uh, and make sure that they understand what the, what the criminal records are um, and, uh, and what kind of supports you can provide to them um, if there are any, if any issues arise. So um, I don't know if Jasmine has probably has some good stuff to add to that. No, I think you hit a lot of it on the head. You know, I, I would strongly encourage you all to advocate if your local COC has not thought about this as a community effort. Um, and here's why. Our direct care staff who are often employed by specific agencies to do work like this really focus in on their clients as they should and their client needs. And I'm a big believer that you need at least one human who, even if it's part-time or you know, based on your local resource availability, even if it's limited, who's looking at the big picture. And, and some of that is simply... The, the process of wooing landlords, really addressing their concerns, having material about our clients and being able to talk in an objective way about the big picture can go a long way to setting the stage when a client is actually ready for that housing and when we have a human that we're speaking about and not just the broad need. Um, and sometimes I think it's also infrastructure challenges. So I'll use a specific example that plagues us in Alaska. We have really strict um, unspoken rules, if you will, about rent to income ratio, meaning that most of the landlords, and, and we have an incredible lack of housing for extremely low income clients, um, most of our landlords will not accept uh, potential rentees who don't have a paycheck or some sort of income that shows that they can afford, that the rent is less than 30% of their income. Um, if you're on disability, if you're an elder or a senior in our community, that means that 99% of the housing in our community will not allow you in simply because of this arbitrary 30% rent to income ratio thing. And it took some advocacy and, and really uh, influence with policymakers to help folks understand that this is not actually an ordinance in the city, it's something landlords do. And now we're bringing together landlords in large groups to talk about this. And, and I get it, I get as someone who worries about paying my bills as well, that this is a concern, but let's talk about other ways we can address this concern. So rather than sticking with this arbitrary rent to income ratio, can we talk about financial management classes or someone who has a demonstrated history of good credit and paying their bills? You know, there's many people who make small amounts of money because of disability who are really great at managing that and stretching their, their, their checks thin. Um, and so helping them to problem solve is best done in an infrastructure level versus every provider doing the work in sort of a disorganized way, which is the reality of our work oftentimes. So I cannot emphasize how important that is, particularly because rapid rehousing is a great way to get folks back on their feet 
um, and allow them to, to see a sustainable, secure future. Um, but lots and lots of communities are doing this in really cool, innovative ways. And, and I'd encourage folks to check it out online. There's tons of resources. Great, thank you. Um, in just a minute, we'll go ahead and open it up to attendees um, and we'll open up the phone line so that way you can also ask your question in that way. Um, one question that we do have is for undocumented survivors, so survivors who don't have um, a legal status or don't have that documentation, are they still eligible to pro, you know, for programs, housing programs under a continuum of care? Or are those more limited, um, but do they still have access to at least some sort of housing program? Well, I'll go ahead and open it up to uh, Martha, Jill, and Jasmine, and you can tell us about your experience with that. Sure. If it's a HUD-funded project, HUD does not require documentation in that way. Um, and so uh, with HUD resources, we are allowed to serve undocumented persons. The challenge tends to come with the landlords who frequently want documentation. And so that would be two different uh, two different levels of conversation. Are they eligible for the HUD resources? Yes. Does that mean that you can use the HUD resources for that person? Possibly not. And Jasmine may have different experience in that. No, I think you covered it. Um, that one's pretty, pretty black or white for one. Thank you. That's very useful. Okay, we're going to go ahead and open up the phone line. Um, and people who are joining us by phone, you're welcome to ask a question. Um, so we'll leave the phone line open for a couple minutes. You're also welcome to add in a question via the chat box, and we, we can ask that um, on your behalf or with our panelists. Okay, great. It doesn't seem like we're getting any questions via audio. Uh, we are, again, so thankful for our panelists for joining us today and being able to share all this wonderful information with us. We know it's extremely useful for the, the attendees and also for anti-trafficking programs to hear more about what COC's structures are. Um, we're going to go ahead and add our contact information on the chat box. If you have any questions, please let us know. Like we mentioned, we will be posting and sharing this um, session uh, on our resource library. And so you'll receive a follow-up email that has that link that you're welcome to share with your colleagues as well. Uh, if you have, there will also be a guide um, or a fact sheet on working with continuums of care. So that way you have some resources available. Um, again, we wanna thank Jasmine, Jill, and Martha. We truly appreciate your expertise and for all the work that you're doing. Thanks to our captioners, um, and they have been extremely useful. Again, if you have any questions, please let us know, and do expect this uh, recording to go up in the next week. Um, and in the, in the meantime, feel free to reach out with any questions that you may have. Thank you again for joining.